All right. We are live and people are trickling in already. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Carcinoid Cancer Foundation Facebook Live series, a special edition for the COVID-19 crisis pandemic that we are all in. All of us are worried, all, all people right now, and specifically, I know that a lot of net patients are. And so we brought this specific version of our Facebook Live, which we typically do monthly. Now we're doing these weekly. We brought this to you to try to answer any of your, your questions and, and calm some of the fears that may be in your, in your minds about this. Um, we definitely want to thank all of our doctors and healthcare professionals that are out there. And our goal with these sessions are to provide a, essentially a one-on-one -on -one session with a, with a specialist, a net specialist that can help give you some guidance in, in your journey in, the, in this disease. If you aren't familiar with me, my name is Rain Bennett. I'm a filmmaker. I've been working with CCF for almost 10 years now, creating video content to you know, spread awareness, raise awareness, and, and help educate people on neuroendocrine tumors and their treatments. And you can see some of my work uh, here on the Facebook page or also on the Carcinoid Cancer Foundation's YouTube channel. A lot of video content there that has a lot of value for caregivers and net patients. Um, before we go any further, I just want to say a big thanks to our presenting sponsor, Lexicon Pharmaceuticals, for their support. If it weren't for them, we wouldn't have this, uh, this Facebook Live series, so we're super, super grateful for that. And today, our guest is Dr. Namrata, also known as Nina Vijay Vergia. How are you today, doctor? I'm doing very well. Thank you for having me. It's yeah, thanks so much for being us here. So for the people that aren't familiar with you, uh, let us know a little bit about your background, where you work, and how specifically you ended up in this, this world of neuroendocrine tumors. Absolutely. So I am a GI medical oncologist. I, am, um, I did all my training in Philadelphia, and I'm currently practicing at the Fox Chase Cancer Center. It's, up, uh, it's one of the comprehensive cancer centers up in the Philadelphia area. We have... Um, we actually, you know, interestingly, our net history goes back to a long time ago. Um, my mentor was a sort of a big name in, in neuroendocrine tumors back in the 80s and 90s, Dr. Paul Engstrom. And he, because of him, he has, you know, now he's over 80 years old and he is retired. But basically, he is the one who, based, who bought in all the uh, net cases to Fox Chase and sort of became like the uh, local referral center, you mm -hmm. may say, for a lot of communities. And that's how we started developing, you know, Fox is the net center. And then I sort of, I trained under him. And then the first time, like I saw a patient with the, where the, what change a creotide did to their symptoms, I just fell in love with this disease and, and have been pursuing it clinically as well as from a research standpoint ever since. So now I've been like doing this for over seven years now. Awesome. Awesome. That's great to hear. And hopefully everybody uh, will get to know you a little bit more and, and you can help some of this community out there because what, what I've noticed about the community is it's such a strong, like everybody kind of fights for everybody in this, in this neuroendocrine tumor family or community. And I, I, for me as like a storyteller, I, I love that aspect of it. So um, we're looking at some, our numbers are rising, people are arriving and, and trickling in. So if you are joining us right now, uh, as I always say, let us know where you are in the world. We love to see how far these reach, and they reach all over the world. That's why we kind of do them around noon Eastern time, because we can get West Coast, we can get the people in Europe. Last time, we even had someone from Australia. So sign in, tell us hello, and tell us where you are signing on from in the world. A uh, couple of bits of housekeeping before we get started. Today, we're still focusing on COVID-19, your health and safety, as it pertains to net patients, okay? So that's going to be the, the, the topics that we're focusing on. If, if we have time and there's general questions, we'll try to get to them. But what I've learned over the past couple of weeks is, you know, a lot of net patients are concerned about this uh, pandemic. And so there's a lot of questions that come up about it. If we don't get to your question, I encourage you to follow up with the Carcinoid Cancer Foundation here on their Facebook page or at carcinoid.org, their website. As far as the questions that we can uh, get to today, please know that they can't be too case specific. Okay, Dr. Vijay Vergia can't, uh, if she's not your doctor, she doesn't know your specific case, she won't be able to speak to the, the, the finer details. What we're, get, we're gonna try to do is give you general advice um, as best we can. So if it's too specific, we may have to pass or just ask you to, to rephrase it or we'll try to answer in, in generic terms. Um, uh, and again, 
if um if we don't get to it just follow back up with carson cancer foundation we'll try to direct you to the right information before we get started a little bit of a disclaimer from our sponsors we just want to say the opinions expressed by the guest presenters uh, as well as the questions asked by the audience have not been created or suggested by the sponsors of the facebook live ccf doesn't endorse or promote any of the views opinions or information provided in this presentation and audience members, that means you, should not rely on the opinions or information expressed by the guest presenter and should seek guidance and direction from their own medical advisors regarding any choices they make about their health or treatments. Okay, so that was wordy and that was a lot of uh, legalese, but the point is, is that we're gonna give you some general advice that helps steer you in the right direction, but by all means, talk to your team, your specific team about the treatments that, that you pursue and make a collective decision. Uh, so uh, with that being said, we've already got some questions coming in. Dr. Vijay Vergia, are you ready? I am. <laughs> so one thing I've noticed since we've done this for a few weeks now, uh, specifically in the COVID-19 topic, is that there are a few questions that tend to keep coming up. And so what I want to do first before we, we start taking the audience's questions, and audience, as you're listening, send the questions in. We'll get to them. Uh, what I want to go ahead and do is, is lay a little bit of a uh, foundation for questions that I presume will probably come up, and I've seen them come up already. Um, first of all, what's different now than when we did the last one of these a couple of weeks ago is we're starting to see some states open up, right? Like restrictions are starting to, to, to mm -hmm. fall off a little bit, or at least we see the quote unquote light at the end of the tunnel. And maybe like where I live, the stay at home order was extended, but till like May 8th. So we're, we're starting to see, um, these restrictions release a little bit. So as that happens, are there any recommendations that you have specifically for net patients as those doors start to open back up? Well, I think, you know, this is a pandemic. This is a virus that we are dealing with for the first time, right? We haven't, uh, so a lot is unknown. Okay. So most of the stuff that you see, you know, one day a drug is working wonders, the next day it's not doing, it's actually causing heart attacks or, you know, arrhythmias and people. So there's a lot of things that keep happening with this disease that we don't know much about. So what I would, I recommend to my patients, what I would do for my family, right? What mm -hmm. I, I think in the setting where I don't know much about things, it's always better to be overcautious, you know, never, never, yes, the restrictions are opening up. That's a great thing. Go start going outside, but still, still it's very important to maintain the physical you know I, I i don't like the word social distance really it's basically physical distancing you know we are physically mm. away from each other not socially you know keep engage yourself socially very much but keep yourself physically distant from someone that you don't know right it's it and and that is and you know it's it's it, this is actually a time of social solidarity we all are committed together rather than being distant socially. But yeah, physically distancing is something you, we should continue to practice even after that. Doesn't mean you need to just be honed in the house, but you know, even if the restrictions are lifted, you start going out. I think mask is a very easy way to you know, control and making sure others don't get infected by you and you don't get infected. It doesn't hurt anybody, right? It's not, it right. has side effects. And washing your hands 20 times a day is the key. My son, who goes to daycare, since the past two months has not had a single nasal infection or because of the fact that we are just crazy about hand washing, you know? That's funny. It has every disease in the world, right? How, uh, how old is your son? Two and a half. Okay, I have a two-year-old daughter, and it's the same, same thing I noticed. And she, she knows the drill. As soon as I, I pick her up, she's ready to go wash her hands, and, and that's hopefully a, a good byproduct of what's going right. on. You have to learn from this. You know, In this world of globalization, things like these will keep happening, I think, in future too. And, our, and even if we open, we got to open it slowly. Yes, don't, don't start going out and having a party of 100 people the day they right. open up the restrictions, right? And that is something that everyone should practice. And if you are a net cancer patient, you should be slightly even more careful, I would mm. say. But I don't think that's, an, as a healthcare provider, I should be very careful because I come in contact with people who may be sick. You know, I would hate to give illness to anyone else, let alone be sick myself. So I think that these are some simple common sense things that we all should continue to follow. You know, yes, if you have to go to work, go to work, but you know, keep distance at work. You know, I like to do it more from my office. You will see more and more patients are coming to the hospitals, but we have modified so much at workplace right now, you know, this with social distancing and infusion rooms in the, where we get our waiting rooms. Like people, it is just, 
it, it is a new world and I think we're going to have a new way of living. I think so too. And I think uh, that's a great point. We're all antsy and we all want to just like break free and run wild, but being cautious is really important and, and doing it in a slow pro- uh, process or progress. Uh, I also really like what you said about the social distancing. I mean, that, that, this connectivity and community, as we already alluded to within the net community and with all of us, is so important right now when we are isolated that I, I love how you, you made that point of like, let's not social distance. Let's, let's find those ways that we can connect with people. This is how we're trying to do it for the net community. But physically for the moment, like, let's continue to just be smart. And uh, if you have to go out, you have to, but be smart, wash your hands, wear a mask if you can. So I think that's great advice. Are there, are there any factors that net patients sh- should consider um, to determine whether or not to have treatments in the next few months? I think that's a great point. I think we, that, is a, that is an ongoing debate in the physician's head every single day when we decide whether we should start somebody on treatment, not start someone on treatment, okay. the different treatment options available. It is very, the, the extent of disease spread and community spread is different in different parts of the country. As you know, mm-hmm. right? if you're in New York, you were, it's a much more difficult situation. Pennsylvania, where I am from, or Philadelphia is not far away. We are also in one of the, you know, sort of a hot zone. But if you're in some place where there's not a hot zone, it's, it's a different degree of stress that each place has. But as physicians, I think we are deciding that um, what, when to restart treatments. I tell you, most of my patients who were on just octreotide in April, I have actually deferred them, you know, for the month of octreotide because we were still learning how to make things better. Now, I think even hospitals and physicians, and you know, we are as most of the hospitals have their cancer center as a separate building because we understand, you know, it, we got to keep it separate from the rest of the hospital. And in that way, we have tried to modify things at, in the hospital. Like our infusion room doesn't have people sitting next to each other. We've like took, taken over some of the infusion, like exam rooms to make them infusion areas, especially for patients who are just getting injections so as to prevent their exposures. We have already, like our waiting rooms are all socially distanced. So I think the last month has helped the hospitals like cope up and understand this new thing. And now I think is the time to get that we are slowly but surely trying to get everyone back on track. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, yes, SARS COVID-19 is a killer, but cancer is also a killer. So we have to get on work you know, sooner rather than later. So I would say that more, you know, there are a lot of different things that have come up, right? You have a mobile administration programs for octreotide. Ipsin is, you know, for example, I'm just, you know, not branding myself to anything you're saying, but there are these companies that are actually um, offering free home deliver home, like, you know, administration for patients. And these are things that we've all like, you know, come up together in the last month that it took us time to like, you know, get all it or create it, but now we have it. Now I think we are the situation I can safely say, at least for my institution, we sort of have it in place where I can safely restart treatments for my patients and having, you know, and, and with their, and that's what we are hoping for everybody. You know, I think um, people talk about getting scans done. Yes. Don't, come into a high risk zone to get your scan done because cities are typically higher risk than rural areas compared to it. But on the other hand, if you come to a cancer center and get your scan done here, you're much safer than if you go into a hospital where patients with cough is also getting a scan done whether, rather right. than coming to a cancer center. So I think talk to your physician. You know, your physician has uh, over the past month has learned. You know, mm-hmm. I have learned how to take the best care of my patient and I think they will direct you what's best for you. You know, great, for great. my patient in my center, I am starting to open things up again, you know, starting patients on treatment again, getting their scans scheduled again oh, in May, sometime in May, like slowly and slowly we are ramping things up again. So that's a light at the end of this. Yeah, talk. absolutely. That's good news to hear. Um, mm-hmm. Are net patients with metastatic disease more likely to get COVID-19? This is a question that comes up a lot. Mm-hmm. I think that, and that's a concern that comes up a lot sure. in mine too. I, I totally validate, you know, the, whoever mm-hmm. the person asked this question is a very valid question. Um, having metast- uh, having cancer per se, you know, they have, there's not been enough studies done. And I think we are trying to get experience of COVID patients who've had net. Like I have one patient that I know of who had metastatic net, had COVID and is doing fine. Like he, he literally was, had a little bit of cough, upper respiratory illness, and he was fine. But that could just be anybody, Right. I personally feel that if you have cancer, you are at slightly higher risk of developing complications, especially if you have pulmonary symptoms associated with your carcinoid. Mm -hmm. If your endocrine tumor is leading to wheezing, asthma, 
and you have uh, tumors that are more in your lungs, you've had prior lung surgery, those patients are slightly at a higher risk of developing complications. I'm not sure you're at higher risk of getting COVID because right. most of our treatments for NET are not chemotherapy. So you're not mm. typically immunocompromised, but you do have decreased reserve of your, um, of your organs, especially the mm. lungs that we worry about here. And, and you know, hyper, we are seeing more and more problems with um, blood clots in coronavirus, like in COVID patients and having cancer increases your risk of getting blood clots. So these are all complications that can happen. And I think we're seeing slightly more in cancer patients than others. Net patients are on the you know, lower end of the spectrum of developing these complications, but still not zero. So as I said, presume everyone else you're meeting is infected and protect yourself. That should be your motto. Mm, I like that. Sim that simple instruction, which is easy to follow. I just want to revisit something. You said that you, di you did have a patient who got COVID-19. Yeah. Can, you, can we talk, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because this is a, this is also a question that's come up a lot and we haven't uh, previously seen any real examples of, of a net patient who, who got it. So could you walk us through like what, what happened to this person? It seems like it, 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 everything ended up okay. So that's great. Absolutely. Like I think the, you know, that he, some got it from somebody in his family, like he had an exposure mm -hmm. and he called us that, Hey, I know somebody who was exposed. We tested him. He was positive. So no symptoms. She actually, the patient lives in a nursing home kind of environment too. So no wow. symptoms at all. Like, and they did an x-ray and they, you know, they were like, Oh, we don't know what's going on. Everything is good. But we just said, you know, we just watched, should we send this patient to the hospital preemptively? We said no, because hospitals are, you know, she'll get two other infections on top right, of right, right, right. So, you know, she is um, asymptomatic is the right word for it. She's completely asymptomatic. We just tested her because she was exposed and she's been doing fine. Okay. That's good news. I mean, because that, that's a question that we haven't really been able to uh, directly answer. We, we've, we've, you know... Um, had theories and hypotheses, but we haven't really been able to take a, a case study from. So that's, that's good news to hear for, I for any net. Once we've told the patient that you're COVID positive, that yeah, I think my appetite is a little low. That was her own thing. And we don't know if it was like one or the other. Was it just the stress of the fact? No, you know, it's a very stressful time. I was stressed for her and. You know, yeah. Her and yeah. And that's what we're seeing with a lot of the net patients. They're stressed and they, they're worried that they are more susceptible to it. And are there, what other guidelines should they follow? And it, it's good to hear that, like, follow the normal guidelines for everybody be a little overly cautious because you are you are sick and you are fighting something uh, but that's great to hear that if if you know the worst case scenario happens and you you get it it is manageable yeah and you know i think at the end of the day we shouldn't manage we don't manage medicine by anecdotes right one person doing very good and other person doing Fair. bad doesn't does not tell me anything about the disease in you right so great point don't take this as a as a point that oh i'm going to do do fine right mm -hmm. there are patients i know patients who are physicians who have died from coral mm -hmm. COVID 19 were very healthy otherwise so i would basically tell you you know don't manage medicine with anecdotes is our goal so yes protect yourself try not to get it but if you do we have ways you know it's not the end of the world either right we can work with it both ways Got it. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. So we have some questions coming in now from the audience, um, which we just had one from Wilma that was, uh, have, have any carcinoma cancer patients survived the coronavirus? So we answered that one. Um, let's see. Should, okay. Should we be all wearing face masks? We kind of talked about this already, but this is also a question that comes up and it's, it's not controversial, but it's a debate out there, right? Do they really work? Um, I have there's no side effect to it. People take 20,000 supplements for cancer, right? You see them taking all these supplements that are marketed out there that will help your cancer. When my patients come and ask me, should I take this supplement or not? I was like, I don't know much about them, but I don't think this specific one is going to hurt or this may hurt or may not hurt is how we decide, right? Again, here, do face masks protect or not? We don't know. We don't have as much information. It makes sort of logical sense, but we definitely know it won't hurt you. So, <laughs> right. I, I, I'm a proponent of that. Yeah. So, and so there's, um, this person is in Ireland and they haven't been officially recommended like the city I live in. They're strongly recommended, uh, if you, if you go outside, but, um, but yeah, that's, yeah, the, I do hear a lot of debate about it and it's just like, 
it, it it's definitely not going to hurt. <laughs> I mean, it's, hurt. it's like, you know, if you do any a cloth face mask, at least it's maybe, God forbid, if you're infected and you don't know about it, right? protect the person in front See, of you. That's, that's the biggest problem I think people are overlooking with this, this disease is that, uh, or this virus is that, um, you know, like your net patient, you can be asymptomatic and not even know that you're spreading it, you know, just yeah. because I feel good doesn't mean so the being cautious is, it seems to be such the, the biggest, you know, guiding light for how we navigate this is to just just be cautious. I think I, I would take that as my civic and a public health duty. To wear. Right. That's how right. I about it. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. Um, okay, so that's my two and a half year old to wear it, but he just doesn't. But yeah, it's tough. <laughs> my my daughter likes to point at mine and kind of laugh at it, but she she yeah, won't. She work. basically brings every every piece of cloth in the house and just puts it on. I like, "Mom has a mask." But yeah, she would not wear it. <laughs> um, okay, so we are over 100 people now. Thanks for joining us today. We're with Dr. VJ Vergia, and we are talking about COVID nineteen, your health and safety. If you're just signing on, let us know where you are in the world, and also if you have friends or family members, patients that you know, caregivers that would benefit from this, go ahead and share the link uh, to any of them. Let them know that we're here. And if they want to join, we'll be here for another 35 minutes. Um, but just know if they can't make it, or if you want to refer back to this video, uh, it, will, it will live right here on the Facebook page. So you can come back to, to the Carcinoid Cancer Foundation's Facebook page and revisit it any time. And we also uh, repost them in smaller chunks on YouTube. So you can check that out there. So, uh, and if you're just signing on, let us know any questions you have, and we will try our best to get to them. So moving forward, Shira asks, will carcinoid patients be safe only when there is a vaccine? This is also a question I've heard before. I think, Shira, we don't, we don't know the answer to that question. Okay? All of us will only be safe if we have vaccinated, but we still know that we get flu despite getting a flu vaccine too. Okay. So at the end, I think what I, we don't know how effective the vaccine will be. I think we just have to, it, it spread like this because we weren't ready for something like this to happen. And I think if we keep ourselves ready, which is, you know, make, make sure we wash our, I think simple work, washing your hands and don't touch your face and nose with it will do wonders for this disease. It's way better than any vaccine. I can tell you that. You know, at least as, I, as far as we know at this point in time. And so once we get a vaccine, you know, we'll, we'll all take it. It will decrease the risk. But until then, this is the vaccine. I like it. Any tips on how to not touch your face? I've never realized how much we touch our face and noses and eyes throughout the day until we were told not to. Yeah. Well, I have bad allergies, right? This is yeah. the allergy season. Right. Constantly itch my eye. I could do, I I realize how hard it is to not do it. Super hard. But it is, but I think you know that's it's a great question, Jira. That whether a vaccine is going to save us all. Yes, I think once the vaccine comes, we will be able to take it and we will feel more confident. But even until then, we can continue to save ourselves, trying to practice these daily health hygiene measures and and uh, and and be out there and still be safe. You know, I don't want my carcinoid patients to be like you know stuck at home. For the, for the foreseeable future till we get a vaccine because that will do something to our site, which is not healthy either. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's the thing I'm noticing too. There's so many different layers and levels of health that we're juggling here right now. You know, mental health being one of them, right? Okay. So, so the, it's really a strange kind of tightrope walk slash balancing act that we're having to do to navigate this, you know, economic health, mental health, physical health, like it's all it's intertwined. I think that's what you have to, we have to be, right? Follow the guidelines, you know, mm -hmm. CDC and your local authorities are weighing all the pros and cons and all the um, risks and the benefits. So follow the guidelines and still be cautious even once they open things up, be cautious and, and, and you know, we got to live our life, right? It's just a new way of living. That's all we have to understand. Absolutely. Um, so speaking of vaccines, uh, Doug asks, there's a, or says there's a concern that a vaccine may not be created because the virus mutates and can be contracted again. Can you speak to that at all? I, you know, again, though, these are all speculations that we're all hearing. We're all listening. You know, there's different, it's, think, it's very similar to influenza, right? You, influenza virus mutates every now and then. We, we typically feel that if you have immunity to one type of it, even if you get a different mutated you know, the variant or mutant variant of the 
you may have some cross in unity too. Mm. Right? These are all these are all different ideas that are put through and put together for this disease. And I just you know I don't know. I have to be very frank. We don't know what we will how effective the vaccine is going to be. There is like in general, viral strains mutating is a very common phenomenon. Okay, we still have vaccines for you know influenza. Influenza mutates so many different ways and types. So having, you know, just thinking that we will never get an effective vaccine is sort of, I think, um, uh, undermining the scientific community. I think they will be able to find something, hopefully. Right. How much, you know, maybe, maybe it will just decrease the amount of time you get very sick or prevent very sick people. You, miss, you can still get it, but you may not get very sick. Or we get an antiviral drug, which will help patients from getting too sick and intubated in the ICU. So I think we are, there are different ways, you know, to maybe just prevent it completely to maybe getting it, but getting it less free, you know, less, I would say, um, more, a much more mild form of the disease, what we, which we just don't know. We'll just have to wait and see. Got you. <clears throat> so Joy asks, uh, have you heard of any dip neck patients with COVID-19? And let's take a moment uh, for anyone not familiar and just establish what dip neck is. So dip neck is um, sort of, it's a diffuse intrapulmonary, you know, um, it's basically in the, what happens is you see multiple nodules in the lungs okay. and it's because it's diffuse, right? That's the word. And it's in the, in the, in the lung and they are um, neuroendocrine cells that are just, uh, it's called hyperplasia, which is just, they're growing in the lungs, you would think. And they're not um, cancerous yet. They're not like that. They can, they don't typically spread to other organs, but they just flourish locally okay. and they produce all the hormones and they cause, they can cause asthma, difficulty breathing and things like that. So um, for, I, I don't, I have different patients. I don't have personally a patient who developed COVID. I would say having said that, you know, because again, the lungs are more likely involved here right. and you may have some degree of uh, respiratory you know, constrictions or just asthma-like symptoms. I don't think you are more prone to get COVID, but I would definitely be extra careful because God forbid, if you do get COVID, there is a chance you may have higher chances of talk, you know, side effects from it. On the other part, most of the patients with Dipnec are not on any immunotherapy, like they're not on any chemo, they're not on any major drugs except of triotype for the most part, that they typically are not immunocompromised, so they do retain their ability to fight infection and hopefully avoid the infection altogether. So make sure, keep yourself safe, Joy. You know, the way to do it is wash your hands, wear a mask, and don't go out physically distant yourself from people. Um, So we have a question that came in that says, I've heard that COVID-19 can be transmitted through aerosolized viruses from feces. Is that true? Can I get this in the bathroom? I don't think so. I think there are different theories. I just don't know. Obviously, I not till now we haven't even settled the debate. If you cough, like you, is this, is, does it stay in the air enough to transmit to other people? Like, I, we, we still haven't sorted that debate out, let alone the other ones. Right. I, I don't think from all the patients that have been infected, there has not been reports of transmission through fecal oral route is what we call it. Whereas that it went into feces, got infected, you know, that sort of infected someone's food and then you ate and you got it. I don't, you know, having said that, I would say wearing masks everywhere you go and washing your hands. The only way you get it is if it you in, it goes into your respiratory tract, right? Mm-hmm. So keeping your respiratory tract fr- safe is helpful, no matter in every way. We we keep coming back to the same like simple instructions. It seems and that's, that's what we know about. I guess you know yeah. everything else is the unknown, and we're all speculating. <clears throat> The yeah. only thing we know is, yes, that's how we can wash it. But, but it's good because, I mean, we, again, back to us doing this tightrope walk and balancing act, like having simple, clear instructions makes it so much easier for people to navigate than, you know, well, if you have this, try this. If you have that, try that. You know, it's, it all keeps coming back to like protecting yourself, being cautious, washing your hands and wearing a mask. So it's, yeah. I think that's good news. Um, okay, moving forward. Uh, Patty asked, they were talking about high dose Prevacid helping yesterday. If you're already on high dose PPI, are you not as well protected? And, and let's also establish what that is as well. So um, Prevacid is a proton pump inhibitor. It's a medication that people are very routinely prescribed for heartburn, reflux, ulcers in the stomach and things like that. So a lot of our neuroendocrine tumor patients are on Prevacid because there, there's a special kind of neuroendocrine tumor called gastrinomas where 
you just have a lot of acid secretion in your stomach from that. And we give patients high dose PPI or Prevacid. These are just the fancy names for these drugs. Um, there have been, um, it, you know, it's back and forth. I actually read that report too that Joy is referring to. So I um, I don't know what to make of it. I think you, it's too like it's a very similar. You go back to ACE inhibitors. Like early on, there was a, a there was a very wide press and that was it was actually accepted by a lot of medical uh, authorities that if you are on a special kind of drug called ACE inhibitors, these are drugs given for high blood pressure and heart problems, and and that you can have a higher risk of complications from coronavirus. Um, over time, we've realized that you know taking patients off of the drugs because if they don't need it has caused more problems than you know the other way around. Similarly, you know for if you are on a PPI, I I think the evidence is very bleak to say the least. I think it's, these are all anecdotes. We don't know if mm -hmm. it's actually true or not. So if you truly need it, if your doctor has put you on the medication for some reason, you want to take it because you really, you know, it's helping you right now. You right. cannot predict the future and the unknown, but if it's helping you, you have to take it. And every day there's new drug concerns in that are coming out. And then two days later, they go away. Like with NSAIDs, everybody was thinking that um, if you take Advil, Aleve, Motrin, that was a bad thing for this disease and WHO even recommended that you shouldn't take these drugs. And then they retracted it later on because really in bigger study, it really did not pan out that way. So, so much is unknown. I wish I could tell you for sure one way or the other, but hopefully we will learn as we go along. Yeah. 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 We're learning more and more. Um, so I'm getting a lot of general questions coming in. I'd like to try to get to some of them. Are you comfortable doing that? Absolutely. Okay. And if there's, if there's, um, anything that you need more information on or you're not comfortable speaking to, just, just let us know and we'll move forward. But um, first, Lori asks, how much should I, Lori is concerned with her immune system. So Lori asks, how much should I exercise during the week to keep my immune system up or is exercise relevant to that? Uh, that's such a, it's a very dear question to my heart, Lori, because I am doing a lot of research on that. And one of, we are actually, it's a very funny, I'll, I'll talk to you about my research too. And for yeah, please. Time. But we are giving our patients, um, you know, we are trying to give them uh, activity monitors, like, you know, these Fitbits, or like whatever kind of physical activity sure. monitors are. And then what we're trying to do is we, we actually are getting samples of the blood to look for inflammatory markers. You know, see, you know, there, there are biomarkers. There's like chemicals in your body that go up when, you're, when there's inflammation and they go down when their inflammation goes down. And we're trying to correlate does being more active leads to lowering of these markers in the blood. So, you know, if there's, if you have low, infl if, if doing exercise decreases inflammation in your body hmm. and that improves your immunity because you know, decreased inflammatory response leads to a better immune system. So we're trying to see that in patients and we've interestingly found some good correlations. So yes, I think, I really believe that doing physical activity improves outcomes in patients because it decreases inflammation and improves your overall, you know, just health and immune system in general. And um, I think we, we have shown in colorectal cancer, we've shown in breast, in breast cancer, doing physical activity, and even in advanced colorectal cancer, if you are physically active, you tend to live longer than if you don't, even after adjusting for all the other factors that can affect longevity. So there is strong data that exercise helps cancer patients. It helps every patient, especially helps cancer patients. So I would strongly recommend that you continue to do what you're doing, Laurie, and even tell others to do it. Any any data on like how it's often? Therapy. So duration. Good. So the recommendations are you exercise for about 30 minutes, three to five times a week, at least 30 minutes, three to five times a week, and um, that's the general recommendation. There is something called METS metabolic equivalent equivalent if you know what that is if you talk to like a, a trainer you would know what that that is but we want to get at least 18 mets a week in mm -hmm. you know, of exercise that's a lot of exercise but if you just half an hour three to five times a week is what you really need to do uh, and, and I'd like to speak to this for a second too, just because this is near and dear to my heart. I've spent a lot of time in the fitness world. Um, I, I was a host for a brief web series called the perfect workout. And one of the things that we learned is this is just my little bit of advice is the perfect workout is whatever it, the one that you do is. So whichever <laughs> one you can commit to coming back to, and that's in fun and engaging, that's the perfect workout. I mean, anything to keep your body moving, your heart rate up, 
Um, but if it's something that you dread going to, a lot of times, some people are disciplined enough, but a lot of times we, we will kind of peter out. So if it's something you, I play in an adult soccer league, it's amazing. But if I wasn't, uh, you know, playing with my team, I don't know that I'd run for 90 minutes. Like that. <laughs> Well, having said that, you know, asking someone like me, like a total hypocrite, I'm feeling, I have a peloton in my in my mudroom. All it's used for is like hanging clothes. <laughs> I could get the best and the most fanciest machine. It's not going to really be helpful, even if yeah. unless I do it, as you say. Yeah. <laughs> so find one that you are excited to get up and, and go do. Take a dance class, you know, y- yoga, whatever, whatever makes you keep coming back. With COVID nineteen, a lot of this, but you know, there's a lot of people who are offering zoom classes too right I've oh yeah seen, there's and it's so much i, I kind of like it because i can actually do it from my home i just right. record it and do it at 11 o'clock once my son goes to bed and uh, right if you have kids at home that's a that's a major plus right so i'm kind of liking that part of <laughs> <laughs> um okay so barney asks after tumors have been removed from the liver should carcinoid syndrome sy- syndrome symptoms be relieved how long does recovery take um, that's a very good question. So carcinoid, you know, depends on how much, you know, was the t- liver the only site of the tumor, right? Mm-hmm. That's the, it, the symptoms, so carcinoid diarrhea, right? That's the sorry, diarrhea is the biggest symptom apart from flushing that comes. That is, um, it's, it's a very interesting way to, you know, of, of patients with carcinoid having these symptoms because you can have diarrhea because of carcinoid. You could have diarrhea because you've had part of your intestines removed. You mm-hmm. can have diarrhea because you have a, you get a triotide shot, which suppresses your pancreas to produce the nice digestive juices that you know digest all the food. So there are various reasons why somebody can get diarrhea, not just it being carcinoid syndrome. Right. If you had surgery where all of the tumors have been removed, let's say, you know, not just, you know, it's all the tumors are removed, including primary and the liver tumors. And there's not no more disease, at least as we know of, left there. Most of my patients do start feeling better in terms of symptoms in about four weeks after that. That's when their body sort of, you know, gets used to it. Four to eight weeks is when they get better. Problem that happens is most of my patients get, you know, get their primary, their tumor in their intestines removed at that time. And they start developing diarrhea because now they have a shorter intestinal tract. So it's hard to distinguish whether it was the carcinoid syndrome diarrhea or it was diarrhea that's coming from their surgery. Mm-hmm. So what we do is if they continue to have diarrhea after that, we tend to you know, address the symptoms, you know, give them bile. You know, there's different kinds of things we can do to um, help with that, those kinds of diarrhea. So I would recommend if it's not better, seeing a, you know, talking to your doctor. And if required, you, know, you can see a GI specialist who makes sure there's no other kind of diarrhea happening too, which can affect our patients as well. Got it. All, all patients who have diarrhea with carcinoid is not directly carcinoid syndrome diarrhea. There are multiple kinds of it you can get. So seeking their help is very, help, very helpful in the setting. Copy that. Um, next question, Maruti asks, what's the best way to control chromogranin A levels? Uh, hers is, is very high, 480, when the normal is supposed to be 75. I think this is a very specific question for every patient. I'm not sure. I don't know if you have a diagnosis of carcinoid. Like I think just chromogranin level being elevated, it's, it's a very uh, nonspecific marker. To be okay. You no, know, we don't really, I really don't even follow it for most of my patients because they, it keeps going up and down for no reason. No, mm-hmm. really. Oh, no. I had a, if you, I had a patient who I um, started on octreotide and then, Four weeks later, the chromogranin came back to normal. And we're like, oh my God, even though the cancer was growing on the skin. So hmm. it, it's a very, very non-specific marker. I always tell my patients not to focus on chromogranin. You know, it's, okay. it, it's a very non-specific marker. Foc- I don't know if uh, Maruti, you have carcinoid or not, or they're just following a chromogranin. It's, I think for your specific case, I need more information, I would say. Okay. But in general, for my patients who have carcinoid tumors and have chromogranin, I actually don't follow chromogranins that religiously because I feel it's, it, it sort of get, creates unnecessary angst more than anything. Okay. Well, Maruthi, ho- hopefully that helps. Uh, if you do have any other information you think would be helpful, helpful for us, try to get it back in. We still got about 20 minutes and we'll try to get back to, uh, to the question. Um, so next we have Sandeep and he asks, um, how long can a patient live with carcinoid tumors in the liver and no treatment? 
Um, and so again, yeah. Very, very, I was about to say the same thing that, you know, carcinoid tumors, and there's a lot of factors that decide how long somebody can live. And it's dependent on, you know, they're called prognostic factors, very well laid out. There's a very nice paper by one of my colleagues at Amy Anderson, Dr. Dasari, and his, his team about what factors affect outcomes in patients with carcinoid. So if you have liver tumors, how much liver tumors do you have? I don't know. You know is it one tumor? Is it many? Right. Uh, what grade of tumor cancer you have? What is the primary site of that carcinoid? We know that tumors that originate in your small intestines tend to do way better than tumors that originate in other parts of the body, including pancreas that was spread, you know, or you know, rectum or any other parts of the bo- of the intestines. So I think I need way more inform- a little sure. more information there, but um, typically we are getting better. You know, all I can say is the average survival can range anywhere from five to 15 years in that range. So, and it's just getting better each day. Good to know. Uh, Nancy asks, what's your opinion on Ludothera? And let's, uh, let's establish what, you know, what that drug is and what it does. Absolutely. So um, I, I'm sorry, what was, what was the name? Uh, This was Nancy. Nancy. All right. Hey, Nancy. So um, Ludothera is a new kid on the block you know, for treatment for neuroendocrine tumors. It has been around in Europe for a long, long time. I used to send patients to Europe to get this treatment earlier. You know, it's kind of shameful being in the US. But now we have it approved in the United States of America. It's, it's a very focused way of giving targeted radiation to the tumors. It's, it's radiation that's sort of attached to uh, optreotide, you know, the, the hormone, that hormone stopping drug that everybody knows about and gets with neuroendocrine tumors. So we've attached these two together. It's given by the IV and, and the optreotide makes, ensures that the radiation goes and attaches just to the tumor cells. So it's very selective way of giving radiation. And then the radiation goes in and does its job and kills the cancer cells. So it is a very good therapy in the big trial that they did. I tell my patients there was an 80% reduction in the chances of your cancer growing. So amazing. That's really yeah. cool. Um, about 18, 17 to 18% of the patient actually saw shrinkages of the tumor. So that's really good too. But it does, you know, every treatment has, there's no free lunch in medicine. Everything has a baggage associated with it. Yeah. This one comes with the baggage of um, lowering of the blood counts, risk of, um, you know, damaging the bone marrow with something called MDS and also blood cancers. Hence, it's an effective therapy, but it's not the first one I use just and you know, take my time to use it only right. because it's not without you know, consequences. Got it. Um, which actually leads to our next question from Vanette. Vanette says, I had the full Ludothera uh, regimen almost a year ago. My numbers are good now, except for the baby cells in bone marrow. Uh, and she asks, what is the next new treatment that has been developed? I have nets in my liver. So I think what, we, what they're trying to do is um, there are different ways where we are like our next research is focusing on. We are a lot of new drugs like um, medic oral pills are being developed to take care of neuroendocrine tumors. And there is a new drug that's actually about to be approved in China, which they have tested there. We are doing clinical trials here. There's a drug called cabozantinib, which is in clinical trials here right now to see if it's effective in these patients. So there are a lot of oral drugs that are being developed. Then in terms of, you know, because of your, it seems like because of, you know, there are baby cells in the blood, in the bone marrow being affected, that just basically tells me is you're having lowering of your blood counts as a result of of this lutathera. Hence, we are, maybe you are not may or I, you may not be a candidate for doing this treatment again down the line, you know, because a lot of our patients get retreatment with Lutathera, which I don't know, but you may or may not be a candidate based on the side effect profile. We are doing the same idea of, you know, of how we attach radiation to octreotide. There are studies that are ongoing, which are attaching um, chemotherapy, novel chemotherapy drugs to octreotide. So we can just deliver high doses of chemo to the cancer cells. These are different things. There's a lot of stuff that's happening. And, and I'm very hopeful that by the time, you know, hopefully you won't need it, but if you need it, we'll have these other new drugs available for you too. Great. Hopefully that helps Vinette. Um, Sharon asked, does sandostatin work better, uh, work better than octreotide for carcinoid syndrome stomach issues? So, um, it's a very, you know, these are very challenging in a confusing way how we label octreotide. Right. 
So sendostatin is octreotide, right? right. Sendostatin is octreotide. It's a longer acting version of octreotide banana. You just, you know, it's, it, instead of the short acting shots, you just get a drug that sort of works for 28 days. It's the same drug. Okay. What we typically do is sometimes patients just need more than what we can give it through them, through the long acting version. And in that case, what we give is we give them some short acting octreotide shots, which they can give to themselves. These are not fun. These are like insulin, you know, how people take insulin, the same way these shots are given twice, three times a day, maybe. And um, they are they are used on top of it Got to it. help symptoms. Typically, what I feel is if someone's on long acting octreotide and their symptoms are not controlled, in, you know, instead of adding the shot every three times a day, I typically start them on a, sep a, a newer drug. It's called Telotristat. It's one of the newer drugs that's come out. And that's a pill version. It's still three times a day, but it's a pill and not an injection. Yeah. And it has been shown in clinical trials and approved to use to help with carcinoid diarrhea. You know, so it's for car diarrhea that's those carcinoid that you just don't control with the long acting version. I tend to supplement it with the use of this drug. And you know, they are, that's, it's an oral pill. So that's the best part. Got it. Um, so speaking of long-term, Kathy asked, do, do I still need to do follow-up tests after 10 years? And I'm assuming uh, these 10 years have, have shown good yes. positive results. Yes. yes. I think that's a great, that's a great news. Congratulations for that. Um, the, it's a, it, the, again, this is a very nuanced question about follow-up after 10 years. Our bigger NCCN guidelines, so the big guideline authorities that we have, they typically recommend follow-up until 10 years. But there was a recent study paper that was published um, from Canada where they, Dr. Singh, they showed that the, it's like, you know how um, there's a breast cancer that the risk you still have, you, you are followed you know, until time immemorial, we would say, because the risk never goes down to zero of the cancer mm -hmm. coming back. And the same is with neuroendocrine. It depends on what kind you have. We typically feel that if you if you are a slightly higher grade tumor, then you really don't need to be followed because if you're okay in the first 10 years, you're good. If it's a really, really low grade tumors that most patients have, in those tumors, there is still a risk of it coming back. So what I usually do after 10 years is, I because you know there's also a risk of continuing exposing somebody to radiation for CAT scans, so you have to balance that too. I typically just see my patients after 10 years and you know, if they have any symptoms, anything out of the ordinary, I then order a scan mostly cl as clinically indicated rather than just mm -hmm. routinely ordering it. Got Some it. of my colleagues just do scans every three years, you know, once in a while, we'll just do one, but it's, everybody's different. Got it. Got it. <laughs> So Kenneth asked a question about probiotics, and we've had a few questions about these. What studies that you know of have been done about using probiotics for mid-gut tumors? I personally am not very uh, not aware of any studies that are that have focused just on probiotics in mid-guts, especially mm -hmm. in our um, you know in our Western medicine journals, as you may say. Mm -hmm. I personally feel anecdotal evidence. I have a lot of my patients who feel better when they take probiotics, but I usually just tell them to eat tons of yogurt, you know, just, just eat a lot of yogurt and that probably will be more um, helpful and be a more natural way of taking probiotics than trying to spend money on fancy drugs because I don't, I don't know of any studies personally Got it. that say that, oh my God, taking this is going to help you. Okay. Um, Let's see. Let's see. Is there where we can get personal advice? Um, AJ asks, we don't have a net expert in Nepal. Is there a way we can get personal advice in the future? What would you, what would you recommend to someone who is having a hard time reaching a specialist? Absolutely. So thank you, AJ from Nepal. I, it's close to India. That's where I'm from. So, uh, so what, what I have a, a lot of people from, you know, we have an international medicine you know, department, you would say, like you can call, you can just, uh, in, you can just Google it up, international medicine at Fox Shays, that's where I'm from, or, and a lot of other institutions have it the same way too. I can just speak to mine for now, but you can just email them and they can, they'll get your records over. We are trying to, you know, we do um, um, consultations for patients, international patients all the time. We provide, you know, I, I think there's a nominal fee associated with it. I'm not 
but other than that, it's a very, you know, we are trying to, now with the COVID-19, we are doing so much telehealth. We've so learned how to just do about telehealth. To say, yeah. is, uh, I think we are trying to you know, um, mm-hmm. roll it out for especially this, these kind of scenarios as well. So I think I would recommend, you know, wherever, whatever institution um, uh, interests you, I would say, you know, you could just reach out, just Google International Medicine associated with that institution. We do it at Fox Chase. It's Philadelphia International Medicine. Mm-hmm. And they, it has an email, you just email them and they will take care of what, they will tell you what you need to do and how we can get a formal consult, which is a more, uh, rather than, you know, the we just put a, um, saying that we just, you know, this is a very limited way I'm talking. So I probably cannot do any personal recommendations right now. Okay. Uh, we have another question about Lutathera. And I think because that is so popular and, and helpful to a lot of patients, I, I want to still touch on that. David asks, he's in the middle of Lutathera treatments, um, which is also PRRT, if people are more familiar with that term. Um, and I like this because David's being his, his own best advocate. He says, is any suggestions on what I can do to improve the chances of success? Um, I think a positive outlook is going to help you the most. You know, I think if you believe it's going to work, it will work. That's for sure. Having said that, there is nothing you can do differently to make it work or not make it work. It is a, it is a function of the tumor and the, and the biology of the tumor itself as to how effective a therapy is going to be. The odds are, no matter what you do, it's going to work. And what I think you can do in during this time is keeping yourself healthy that you don't have too many side effects from the treatment, that you actually can get the full treatment associated with it. Trying to eat healthy, keeping yourself physically active is, you know, obviously distancing yourself while you're getting the treatment is um, so that you don't expose others and stuff like that too. And with COVID-19 specifically, you know, you got to be careful about all of these, but keeping yourself healthy, a healthy diet is going to help a long way. I think that that's the best thing you can do to help. You know, if you eat, that improves your immunity, improves your ability to fight infections if you get any, and it ability to get treatment and then let the treatment do its job. Got it. Got it. Great advice. Um, okay, so we have about five more minutes left, so we've still time for a couple more questions. Uh, if you guys have been getting great value today from Dr. Vijay Vergia, give us a little thumbs up or a heart emoji at the bottom of your, uh, your viewer and let us know we're doing a great job. We are here to serve you. Um, I, I, if not, I'll give it to my son, who just <laughs> love emojis, and he's going to just keep pressing. Yeah, just keep <laughs> 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 Uh, Sherry asks, uh, does carcinoid syndrome go away after the tumors are removed? Um, so carcinoid syndrome, if all the tumors are removed, right, that's the source of the hormone. Mm-hmm. So technically, yes, I had a patient with a patient recently with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, which spread to the liver with horrible diarrhea, starting on Lenry. Like I saw him as an urgent consult because he was so miserable and we started, like, he was doing great on lenriotide. In the meantime, we ended up geared him up for surgery. He got a surgery. Doesn't need out lenriotide anymore. Like, you no, know, I think that's, it should, it should work typically if you are, um, if, if they're able to get all the tumors that are in there, because sometimes this tumor can be sneaky. Mm-hmm. You, know, you can still have tumors. You thought you got everything out, but there might still be something there. And that's a situation where the hormone levels are sort of sometimes helpful. Got you. Um, oh, we have uh, another specific question about COVID-19. Paula asks, do you recommend soaking slash cleaning fresh, fresh veggies and fruit before cleaning? Can you get COVID from food? This is actually, I've heard a lot of people talk about this. I'm oh my God, I have researched so much on this. Let's go. So much work. It is so much work to do all that. Like, you know, clean the groceries and then keep them, make sure they dry. Because if you put them into the refrigerator without drying them, they get spoiled very quickly. And then you make a, another grocery run. So I, I have done some research on my own for this. So I can, I, from what I haven't found out is, again, transmission, fecal oral route, whether like, you know, some things on the food and you eat it and you get it is, is very, is not known for this disease in general. Having said that, I think what happens is you worry about 20 people touching, not like the veggies themselves. The veggies you will cook and you will eat it after that. Rather than, you know, like the, the, the covering, like I have a cheese, a box of cheese and the cover of it. So right. what I personally do is I 
you know, I, I take, I, a bleach is the safest way to clean things. You know, I have bleach tablets. You can just mix it in water and you have a bleach solution. It's safe. It's not toxic to you, you would say. So I just, you know, clean wrappers. I just clean everything up. Any of the food items, I just put them in a bag and then leave them in my refrigerator. And when I make food, I just wash them very well at that mm. moment. I do not preemptively wash things. That's really, there's no major data for or against it. And, and can we clear one more thing up? When you wash them, what do you use? Do you use just water, cold water? Hot water? I just use water, yeah. but I'm not, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I, I think people have done everything. I wouldn't use bleach for my vegetables. That no. I can tell you. <laughs> but I, I saw a debate going on or actually uh, people, someone said that uh, his wife was washing all the, the fruits and veggies with soap. And I, I heard that, um, that wasn't really the way to go because they're porous and they'll, they'll soak I, I, them into the, to the warm bar water is good enough. Yeah. Okay. Um, cause I wasn't actually sure about that, but I, I never washed it with soap. So you I think it's, as I said, you know, I think a lot is unknown. We don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe what I'm doing is not, but I think from the stuff, there was a recent article in CNN about it too, which is fake news. Most people think, but, uh, <laughs> but again, there's a, there's that there's not like, I think you, easily you can just live your wash clean stuff that has in wrappers from outside but other than that just put them in nice boxes and then when you use them you just wash them with warm water and you're ready to go sounds good um cook them i don't if if you're just going to eat like vegetables raw like lettuce and stuff or those are the things i would wash very thoroughly with hot water Got it. Got it. Uh, well, it is time. Our hour is up. I just wanted to ask you, thank you so much for taking the time today to, to, to talk to us and, and the people out there. But is there any more final advice that you would give to net patients? Again, we've talked about this. Everybody's nervous. I'm nervous. Um, but I've, I've found that specifically working with the net community as I do, um, that net patients are are a little fearful at times. And I feel like the information we gave them today gives them a lot of reason to be hopeful, yet cautious. Is there any final words of advice that, that you would give to net patients as we proceed in the next month or two and hopefully seeing this light at the end of the tunnel? I think what the way I would put it is that, yes, there is light at the end of the tunnel. That's the most important thing. We will get, we will get there. Science is doing what it's supposed to do, trying to find, follow the advice of your authorities and CDC. That's the most important thing. And your doctor, whatever they, they, they are not giving out advices, just, based on nothing like they are doing whatever they're doing is for a reason trust them that's the most important thing and it's important local doctor and local authorities because the extent of the disease is different in every part of the country so mm -hmm. you cannot trust me if you're living in you know some different part of this country at this point in time i would say that being physically distant but in social solidarity is the key right now you know i read it somewhere and i just this this is like a phrase that sort of uh you know, made sense to me at this point in time. Just talk to people. You know, there's, a, as you said, net community is so strong, right? You can just connect. You have all these amazing organizations that help, that provide a platform for people to connect with each other. Just connect with each with each other through these communities, and 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 just keep yourself safe. For and you will, we will all get through this. Thank you so much, Dr. Vijay Vergia. And thank you to the audience out there. Thank you to CCF. Thank you to our sponsor, Lexicon Pharmaceuticals, for making this happen. Um, as I said, the, the video will live here on the Facebook page if you want to refer back to it. Um, but we're going to be doing this um, periodically. We've been doing these every month. And more recently, we've been doing them every week for the COVID-19 pandemic. If we didn't get the chance to get to your question today, follow back up with CCF either here, send them a message on their Facebook page, or you can visit their website at carcinoid.org, and we will try to get to that. If there are any topics, because we're going to be doing these monthly, you know, we've been doing them monthly for almost a year now, and then we've done a lot here in the past month for the COVID-19 pandemic. But as we continue, if there are topics that you'd like to hear more about, let us know, and we'll try to try to get to them as well. Um, everyone be healthy, be safe out there. Thank you for your time, doctor. Thank you to the audience and uh, see us next time on the Carcinoid Cancer Foundation Facebook Live series. Thank you. Thank you for having me.